We do want to welcome all of you to our afternoon's program, and if I might just briefly outline the highlights of our program. Of course, to begin with, we'll be hearing from Brother Daniel Sidlick from the Brooklyn Bethel family and a member of the governing body. And then uh, after Brother Sidlick's talk, Brother Richard Smith, our circuit overseer, will share experiences with us. And finally, in conclusion, uh, Brother Sidlick will share some concluding comments. So all in all, a very fine program is outlined for this afternoon. So we've welcomed all of you. I'm sure all of you would like to welcome Brother and Sister Sidlick to Detroit. And we're pleased to have them with us this afternoon from the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses in Brooklyn, New York. Brother Sidlick is going to... Brother Sidlick is going to be speaking to us on the subject, Faith Building Begins at Home. Brother Sidlick. First of all, I'd like to say that I bring to you the love and greetings of the Brooklyn Bethel family and the governing body, and they're always anxious to know how you brothers are getting along in the kingdom interest. So uh, happy to do that. It's marvelous for you brothers to invite us out of New York City. Somebody pay the airfare to get us out from there to see a little bit of autumn and to have a change of pace from what we normally do in the city of New York. Well, we're enjoying one of the best spiritual harvests in the history of the organization. And let me tell you, this coming year, the World Annual Report is going to really surprise you. It's, it's just simply marvelous, marvelous to behold when you stop to think that we've had over 225,000 people baptized last year in Jehovah's Organization. And the growth is so phenomenal that uh, you can feel it. It's in the air. And it's everywhere. And if when you see Jehovah's Organization growing the way that it's growing, well, we know one of these days Satan is going to get very, very jealous of it. And he's going to make a bold move against God's people. So while we're enjoying one of the best of spiritual harvests in the history of Jehovah's organization, yet sad to say, at the same time we're losing many of our youths. Yes, many of our children are turning to this system of things. And you wonder why, because there's certainly nothing out there. Parents are perplexed over this, and they ask, what can we do to hang on to our children? We want our children to be in the truth. They're the promise of the future. They're the youth. They're the lifeblood. So it is quite nice to have children to be at home. Home, of course, to Adam was paradise. And to the good among mankind, home is still paradise. And for us, we who are studying God's word, we're moving toward paradise. Paradise, earth, under Jehovah's righteous system of things. Doctors tell us that the first sure symptom of a health, healthy mind is a rest of heart and pleasure felt in the home. So when there's a happy home, you have happy children. And when you have happy children, you have healthy children. And healthy children are easy to talk to. It is the disturbed children of this earth that you find very difficult to communicate with. Our home joys are the most delightful joys that we can remember. And the joy of parents the joy of being with brothers and sisters lifts our hearts to the Father in heaven. So often we think of mother and dad and home. Home should be the happiest place on the face of the earth. And when we grow up, 
to value this delicious home feeling is one of the choicest gifts a parent can bestow on their offspring. We are our happiest when we find peace at home, when the home is ruled according to God's word. The poets say that even angels might be asked to stay with us and they would not find themselves out of their element if our home is at peace and they would feel right at home. Home is where we love to learn, to have the joy of heart, to feel what peace really means, to see plenty on the table, where we learn of supporting and being supported, where friends are born. And when we see the joy of relatives mingling together, what a beautiful thing it is to have a homecoming. The strength of a nation is in the intelligent and well-ordered homes of its people. When you see homes disintegrating, you know that the nation itself is disintegrating. Yes, home is where we learn to, of integrity and how to mingle integrity with love, where we learn of the principles of Jehovah God and how to abide and to live by these. There's sort of a magic to that little word home. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like home. And the child largely becomes what it is taught in the home. Hence, we must watch what we teach the child in the home and how we live in the home. The most essential element in any home is God. Is God in your home? Is Jehovah God there? Is Jehovah God in your home? It is in the family circle where faith is born, where Christianity finds its roots. The very essence of Christianity begins in the home. We build our characters. There we build our personalities. All of this is formed in the home. What we really will be to a large extent depends upon the type of home we come out of. What we become in our older years is largely determined by our training and home environment. Genuine faith is built in the home. It is the one spot that is supremely blessed and dearest than all the rest. So let's talk a little bit about the home. Today when you move about from congregation to congregation, you find that there are so many children being born and being brought into Jehovah's organization. And believe me, brothers, when I say to you that it's an awesome, awesome responsibility to bring children into this world in this day and age. It is frightening. You should meet the fathers and mothers who have spent 10, 15, 20, 25 years and poured their hearts into their children only to find them to walk out on the truth and what is so precious to the parents and what is so precious to life. If you don't think that tears the heart out of you, you haven't lived yet in this system of things. You want to open your Bibles to the book of Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And let us read this verse together. There. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5. Here the Apostle Paul is writing to the young man Timothy. And he says, For I recollect the faith which is in you without any hypocrisy. Notice how Paul puts that. So Paul asserts that there could be faith with hypocrisy. We could be bluffing our way in the truth. We could be feigning that we are in the truth, that we have faith, we're going through the motions, and we're not really devoted and committed to Jehovah's organization. So Apostle Paul makes that a point here. 
He says, For I recollect the faith which is in you without any hypocrisy, and which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, but which I am confident is also in you. All right. This is not really a spectacular text, is it? E- either is it. We read verses far more striking than this one. There's nothing special about it. No dazzling miracle here. No big names. Just a couple of ordinary people living in the small town of Lystra by the name of Timothy, Eunice, and Lois. And here they had this son, Timothy, and Paul writes about them. But the beauty of this text is this, that the more you read it, the more its wisdom and importance shines through to you. Here we find where faith building is at its very best. What do we see here in this text? We see the home, the place where the home place plays in the building of faith. We see three generations of Jehovah's Witnesses and a single family in the truth, and they're still going strong. And that is something in any generation, and especially so the generation that we live in, when faith has all but disappeared from the face of the earth. To have three generations of Jehovah's Witnesses in one home, that's something to be proud about. Look at the world today. You have over a billion Chinese brothers, over a billion of them totally faithless, without faith in God, Jehovah. You have over 325 million Russians, totally faithless. 600 million Indians, faithless. Look at the Pakistanians, people from Afghanistan, the continent of Africa, the Isles, of the sea and for the most part this world is without faith in Jehovah and when Jesus said when the Son of Man comes will he find this faith in the earth the faith in the true and living God but here in this little town of Lystra this one home we we see faith being passed down from one generation to another And what a beautiful place that home is. What memories it has, what experiences it has, home. When young people leave home, they tend to forget how important home life is to them. How important the home is to faith and how important we are to one another. It is hard to imagine anything more important than the home to the building of a balanced life and personality. Isn't it amazing in the light of this how many parents complain about not having time, that they're too busy with the many demands placed upon them, that they have no time for home life, no time to play with the kids, no time to pass on faith, No time for Bible study. Only time for work and go to bed. But they do have time to bring children into this world. And those who least can afford it do so. And God is going to hold them responsible for this. And that is what makes this so serious, brothers. We have children growing up right before our very eyes that are not taking hold of the truth with our heart and with our mind. And we have to learn how to teach these children the principles of Jehovah God. Fathers say, when can I have time? My, I have to lead the group out in the kingdom service. I have to make shepherding calls. There are judicial committees to go to. There are elder meetings to attend. Who's going to prepare the service meeting? There are circuit assembly parts. There are conventions. I've got to work. He should have thought of that before he had his children. 
But the fact is, when he brought children into the world, he brought upon himself an awesome responsibility. Because these children are a part of God's doing. God allowed men to have children, and the responsibility is for them to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of Jehovah. Our watchtower, a recent one, since this responsibility, it's the June 15 issue, 1986. And paragraph 20 has this to say. Now just listen closely, especially you elders and you mothers. Nor should we overlook our responsibility in the rearing of our children in the discipline and mental regulating of Jehovah. Ephesians 6, 4. Actually, this comes ahead of other theocratic duties and privileges. Do you hear what that's saying? This responsibility of rearing children comes ahead of other theocratic duties and privileges. So your children are your personal responsibility. It's a heavy responsibility. And it comes ahead of preparing a service meeting part, a part in the circuit assembly or a part in the district assembly. If you don't have your children on the order, the Bible tells you you're worse than in an infidel. So there's a great responsibility there. And then the watchdog goes on to say this. Sad to say, this is a principle that has been overlooked by some Christian parents. On the other hand, parents must be willing to sacrifice pleasures and comforts for the sake of their children's emotional and spiritual well-building. Spending a reasonable amount of time with them and showering love upon them. On the other hand, parents must show firmness and they are counseled to chastise your son and he will bring you rest and give much pleasure to your soul. So in these ways and you will be very likely to reap bountifully by having integrity keeping children who respect you and feel close to you. So that comes to you from the uh, June 15th watchtower of this year. It's telling you to take care of your children, to spend time with your children, to educate, to train, to teach your children these ones that you have brought into the system of things. Now it's good for us to be busy in the things of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says that we should be busy in the things of the Lord. But if you will not teach your children the, fun the fundamentals of life, if you don't teach them integrity and the principles of Christianity, please tell me who's going to do it. Are the children going to go down here on the streets of Detroit and learn these things? Are the churches going to teach their children the principles of Christianity? Are the politicians going to do it? Are you going to send them to school and are the school teachers going to do this? No. That responsibility rests upon you, parents who have brought the children into this world. The home front is where it all begins. The home is one of the most important places of building of faith. The home means transmitting faith and other ideals to our children. Now the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 24 and 25 there Jehovah says, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, cattle and reptiles and wild animals, according to their kind. And man was made after his kind. And the home is where we are in truth and in fact reproducing children after our kind. It is in the home where the foundation is laid for the future. And if we don't help lay that foundation for our children, then please tell me who is going to do this for them. The Apostle Paul wrote 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. 
and he really knew the importance of the home to faith. Paul was not trained in the Christian home. Paul was trained in a Jewish home of Hebrew parents. And the Jews were very, very strict in the training of their children. So Paul was very well aware and acquainted with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 11. Years later, the apostle Paul found himself in Rome, and there he was in prison on death row. And while he was in prison, he had a lot of time on his hands to think. And he reminisced about his childhood days. He knew that his life was soon to be snuffed away by his, the enemy. In prison, Paul reflected over the years, and he was very conscious of the good that Jehovah God had rewarded him. You know one thing that the Apostle Paul appreciated in life, after being in the full-time service some 34, 35 years, one thing that he had really, that really touched his heart, that God put him in touch with a real man, a real man who had genuine faith. This was a young man, and of all the men that the Apostle Paul knew, this young man revealed to him an appreciation of faith that Paul didn't see in any other man. Now listen to what Paul says in the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 to 24. There he says, I hope under the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. It will cheer me to hear news of you. There is no one else here who sees things as I do and takes a genuine interest in your concern. Notice what he said, there's no one else here who sees things as I do. But Timothy's record is known to you. You know that he has been at my side in the service of the gospel like a son working under his father. Timothy then I hope to send as soon as ever I can see how things are going to be with me. Now, of all the men that Paul knew, and he knew many of them, only Timothy stood out in his mind as genuine. The man on whom Paul's mantle of responsibility would soon fall. Paul thanked God intensively day and night for this young man, Timothy. His unfeigned faith made him a giant in Paul's eyes. Paul never forgot that that faith the first belonged to his grandmother, Lois, and then to his mother, Eunice. Paul was grateful for a mother who told her son about the wonderful works of God in such a way that it made a man among men. Paul knew that Timothy came to be the man that he was because of the type of home that he came up in. Frankly, it was very modest of the Apostle Paul that he did not claim Timothy for himself. Some brothers are forever, oh, shining up their trophy cases, as it were. They say, these are my sheep. They enjoy taking credit for conversions that might honestly be attributed to the training and discipline that was offered in the home. At Bethel, we have an evening when we are introduced to the Gilead students, it's amazing to hear how many times the students will refer to the home. Over and over again we hear these young people coming up before the Bethel family saying, my mother's faith impressed me. Oh, how I love to see my dad read the Bible and how I enjoy the way they talked about the field service experiences. So young people in the home were absorbing the truth. When parents were talking with one another, they were absorbing the truth through their eyes to see mom read the Bible and how dad liked the truth and how they invited full-time servants into their homes and talked about these things. 
These may seem like ordinary, everyday happenings, yet they are building blocks of faith, chiseled into the minds and hearts of young ones, so much so that in later years these various experiences surface as food for thought, as assurances, as building blocks of support. These various expressions have built fiber into the child in which they come to rely on in later life. So when your children leave home, what do you think they think about? They think about what went on in the house. And if it was theocratic training, these thoughts come into their mind and these very thoughts prove to be strength to them. They do not forget what you teach them in the home. And without these building blocks, the child will most likely flounder in life as he grows older and must rely upon himself to face the rigors of everyday living. Let's go back to Timothy now. It so happens that Timothy came from a very small town. Here in the States, we might call it a hick town. It was Lystra. So small that everybody knew everybody, and they knew everybody's business. We have towns like that in Michigan, little places. Fact is, I grew up in a little town like that in Carroll. I guess when we were there, it was just a little over a thousand people in that town. And believe me, it was the hardest place on face of the earth to witness. Everybody knew everybody. You knocked on the door and all the curtains moved aside to see who was there. And they watched whether you went in or whether you went out. And if they had a good hearing aid, they knew what you said. And they listened very closely. On one occasion, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas came to this little town of Lystra. Nobody knows really why they went there, but they were traveling through Asia Minor, so in this very small place, Paul went. And Paul was the talker. And so wherever Paul went, he would go into the city square or in the center of the town. I don't know how they gathered an audience, <clears throat> whether they beat the drums or whatever they did. The people came out, and the apostle Paul was started to talk to them about Jesus Christ. And on this occasion, they carried a crippled man, a man who had never walked. And they dragged this man up and they placed him before the Apostle Paul. And Paul, of course, gave his lecture and he was watching the people. And he noticed how this crippled man was listening to him. That there was faith in the man's eyes. You know, when you give a talk, you know well, who's listening to you and who isn't, especially in the kingdom hall where everybody is close by. Over here you can fool me because you're far away. But nearby, you can tell. You're like an orchestra leader. He knows which ones are playing and which ones are not. And when we give a talk in the kingdom hall, we know the brothers who are listening and the sisters who are picking their fingernails and are looking everywhere else and not doing it. You know how your talking is going over. But at least Paul knew he had one man in that audience that was listening. And it was this crippled man who had never walked. And Paul finished giving his lecture. And after he finished giving his lecture, he walked up to this man. And no doubt the audience do, did what we do after a dismissal of a lecture. They were all talking among themselves. So the Bible account says that Paul said in a very loud voice. So evidently, this account in Acts chapter 14, beginning with verse 8, so evidently, Apostle Paul wanted to draw the attention of the audience to what he was going to do. So in a very loud voice, he says, do you want to walk? And this crippled man says, of course I want to walk. I'm close to 40 years old. I've never walked. So Paul says, all right, if you want to walk, get up and walk. And to the amazement of the audience who heard Paul say these words, the man's muscles began to move, his legs began to straighten out, and the man got up and started to walk. <clears throat> Imagine yourself there, knowing this man for at least 38 years, and suddenly seeing him do what he had never done before, his walk. 
Well, the people were astounded. And what did they say? They said, you know, the gods have come um, among us and they've come in the form of the flesh. And they called Barnabas Zeus and they called uh, the apostle Paul Hermes because Hermes was the talker and Barnabas was the father image. And the priests of Zeus quickly ran and they began to make sacrifices and they were going to offer sacrifices to the apostle Paul and Paul and Barnabas ripped their garments and said, please don't do this. We are ordinary men just as you are. And the Timothy was there and Timothy saw Paul do this and Timothy saw this miraculous change in the man being able to walk. So here Paul, one moment is proclaimed to God. A couple of weeks later, who should come into this very same town were Jews from Antioch, Iconium, and uh, they came to Lystra, and they said, where is this Paul and Barnabas? And <clears throat> these are bad men. And they stirred up these very same people, and these very same people stoned Paul. And they literally dragged his body outside of the city and left him outside there for dead. How sweet it is. So, one can be a god one day and stone dead the next. What happened to Barnabas, we don't know. Maybe Barnabas was smart enough to be out of sight when all of this was going on. But Timothy was there, and Timothy saw this. And Timothy, was he moved by this? No doubt anybody would move, be moved by it. He saw and heard Paul preached and being hailed as a god, and soon thereafter he saw him stoned. And this experience must have made a great impression on Timothy. And yet Paul did not presume that this incident, however dramatic as it was, was the thing that really brought out faith in Timothy. Paul never said that this was what created faith, genuine faith in this young man. Paul gave credit to a God-fearing home for that faith, the faith that he said that Timothy had. So many of us make the mistake of thinking that sometimes we have people that we'd like to impress and bring into an accurate knowledge of the truth that we'll take him to a large convention and we'll show him all these people and they're going to be so impressed that this is what's going to motivate them and they're going to come into the truth because of this. And lots of times young people and older ones will bring their studies to Bethel and they'll show them the machines and the presses and the standing this and the computers and they talk about all of this and they feel that this physical, these physical things are go so going to impress these people that these people are going to come into the truth and have genuine faith. <clears throat> and the truth of the matter is, while these things are very impressive, they are not the things that build faith in people. Faith comes from the hearing of the word of God, from taking in knowledge and from suffering and living according to God's will and ways. So what we fail to see is that in those day-by-day -day happenings in the home is what does the building of genuine faith. It is at home where you are doing the building of the children after your kind. Now let's pause a moment and see how serious all of this is. The Bible speaks of a time when there would be famine in the land. Not a famine after bread or a thirst for water, but after the hearing of the word of God. We have reached that place in time. But we must realize that there is a literal famine in the earth today for real bread, for true, wholesome body-building and mind-building food. 
It amazed me to read a couple issues back in the Awake magazine that there are billion children on earth today literally starving to death. Billion. Not that these children don't have food to eat. They do have food. But they are dying from malnutrition. They're not eating nutritious food. Food that can supply their mind and their heart and their limbs to the building of them as healthy individuals. That the food that they're eating it gives them very little nourishment today. It has no bodybuilding and no by mind-building substance to it. So that the children are growing up mentally and physically deficient. This is what's frightening today. The danger of this is its ill effects on the body at first is seldom noticeable to the human eye. Malnutrition is usually invisible. Even a child's parents cannot tell with the eye if its child is being nourished properly or not. In one study in the Philippines, over 50% of the mothers of malnourished children thought their children were growing strong and that they were well developed. They could not see that the children were actually too small for their age and that they were not developing properly. These children were literally dying from lack of nourishment and the mothers and fathers didn't know it. They could not see that their children, their babies, were growing perilously weak and could not resist infection. The youngsters just did not have the needed energy to fight off disease any longer. Here in the United States, we believe we have more than abundance to eat, but you'd be surprised to learn how many of our children are malnourished. They're raised on junk food, cookies, cakes, candies, hot dogs, hamburgers, greasy foods, potato chips, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, Sprite, every possible junk that you could ever pour into this body is being fed them. And there's no food value in that junk food. And the problem is we love it. And I must admit I love it too. Every now and then I like a healthy hamburger with a great big onion on it and those potato chips which I cannot afford I eat like as if they're going out of style. But it tastes so good. And that's what those business people out there know. They're not interested in your health. And we eat too much sugar, brothers, and too much salt. And therefore, little children are having heart disease, kidney problems, and they're having growing up problems. And sometimes you wonder, when we have studies in homes with people, and we're trying to convince children, or we're trying to convince the parent, and we can't get the truth to them, we wonder what on earth is wrong with them. It just very might, well might be that their mind is not developed to the point that they can absorb truth any longer. They do not have brains that are healthy and strong and capable of understanding God's Word. And that is the danger that this generation is facing, brothers. Satan has fed them every possible type of propaganda and garbage along with physical food that is not really food and nourishment, nourishing to them and they're eating and taking the written page and this into themselves and they're breaking down totally long before Armageddon arrives. If you were to read some of those names on those packages, if you could pronounce those names, you find what you're eating is very, very bad for you. And there's another factor here that we must consider probably the least visible and the most devastating damage done by malnutrition is done to the brain. By the age of four, when your child is four years old, a child's brain has reached 90% of its adult weight or capacity, whereas its physical body is only 20% developed. 
It is this astonishing rapid growth that makes the brain so vulnerable to poor diet during pregnancy and infancy. So you mothers out there, if you want children and healthy children, start when it's still in your womb by feeding yourself healthy, decent food. Therefore, you're going to give your child a chance in life. And when this child comes forth into this system of things, pay particular attention to what he is eating in his early years because he's developing his mind, his brain is being developed. And if he doesn't have a good brain, he can't absorb theocratic instructions into his body, he can't make decisions that are so vital to him in this day and age. And without adequate nutrition, the systematic, now or never, schedule of brain development is affected. Deficiencies now can never be made up later. Scientists tell us that the cells of the brain are not replenished. Once the brain is developed, that's it. It's not renewed as the rest of the body. The result of all this is that millions of children today Their brains are badly damaged by deprivation and by which the parents feed them. And they'll never reach or be able to reach their true potential in life because of this fact. Millions. They figured about an estimated 15 million children in the United States are dying of malnutrition both visible and invisible. But let's face an even greater danger and a very real possibility. It is believed today that these brain cells that are not regenerated, once the full complement is formed, there are no more new cells added to the brain, and therefore if the brain is malformed, then most likely the child will be retarded handicapped for the rest of his life. So that's why we're talking this way to you. If you want to bring children to the world, fine. But it's an awesome responsibility. Know what you're doing. And bring these children up the way Jehovah intended them to come into this world. The reason we say this is because there is even a greater danger. In the brain is where the personality is formed, where we receive our identity, where we become known for what we are. It is in the brain where we are fashioned as a person. You can replace a heart for some period of time, and the person still remains the same person. You can replace a limb or an organ, but the brain is a different story because then a person takes on a completely different identity. If they ever transplant your brain into another person, that person is going to be you and not you, yourself. And that is why it is critical for us to protect the mind and heart with all our powers. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore, my brothers, I implore you by God's mercy, to offer your very selves to him, a living sacrifice dedicated and fit for his acceptance, the worship offered by mind and heart. Adapt yourselves no longer to the pattern of this system of things, but let your minds be remade and your whole nature thus transformed that you will be able to discern the will of God and to know what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see here that the Holy Spirit, God's Word, remake the mind, not the brain. The mind can be remade over. And so these patterns, these patterns that we develop into our brains can be changed for the good if we have a healthy brain that is able to function in the way that it should. Now, this has reference to the application of God's Word and the Spirit in our lives, whether we are living according to the life patterns. At Ephesians chapter 4, adapt yourselves no longer to the pattern of this system of things, but let your minds be remade and your whole nature thus transformed 
that you will be able to discern the will of God and to know what is good and acceptable and perfect. You see here that the Holy Spirit, God's Word, remake the mind, not the brain. The mind can be remade over. And so these patterns, these patterns that we develop into our brains can be changed for the good if we have a healthy brain that is able to function in the way that it should. Now this has reference to the application of God's word and the spirit in our lives, whether we are living according to the life patterns. At Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19 to 31, we read, That is not how you learn Christ. For were you not told of him, were you not as Christians taught the truth as it is in Jesus, that leaving your former way of life, you must lay aside the old human nature which, deluded by its lust, is seeking toward death. You must be made new in mind and spirit and put on the new nature of God's creating which dwells itself or shows itself in just and devout life called for by the truth. So the force actuating the mind and the thoughts and the ideas born of Holy Spirit of which we read in God's word, these ideas fortify your mind against corruption. They are the forces that resist the downward trend of dying man. They make it possible for you to have a clean conscience and a good relationship with God. And it is at home early in life that this adjustment of mind and heart, this is where it ought to be made. Now let's steer away from the physical malnutrition and see how this applies even to a greater extent, spiritually speaking. At first, the spiritual weakened condition cannot be observed by the naked eye. But soon it will manifest itself by the actions of men. And the Bible tells us this. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 16, there we read, and he's speaking of the Israelites there, and they were continually making jest at the messengers of the true God and despising his word and mocking at his prophets. So this was the manifestation of their bad spiritual state. This mocking, jesting, joking as it were, until the rage of Jehovah came upon his people. And notice the phrase at the very end, though, brothers, here in this text. Until there was no healing. This is what's frightening. Up until the time God could heal them, there could be a change around. They could have changed their personalities and righted their course. But there comes a time when this is not able to be done anymore. And they will be like Esau, who even though he wanted to get back his birthright and he sought it with bitter tears, was not able to do so. Why not? Look what Jeremiah 30, verse 13 says. There is no one pleading your cause for your ulcer. There are no means of healing, no mending for you. This is God speaking to Israel. No mending for you. Their condition is hopeless. If God can't heal them, then who can? So, in a physical way, you take, for example, an airplane flying over the Pacific Ocean. The pilot takes the plane and he flies over the Atlantic and there's a point in the Atlantic that they call the point of no return. And when the plane reaches that point, they are advised by radio and by communication, if there's any problem with the plane, don't turn back because the distance is just as close if you keep going. And this is the way it is with corruption. Corruption at work in man eats away. And if we feed it, 
we can just as well go too far and there's no returning from that corruption and we, we literally destroy ourselves. Brain development is now or never. The renewing of the mind is now for salvation. If a child's mind or even if an adult's mind is damaged beyond recovery or healing, then you ask yourself, what hope is there for that individual? Which helps us to understand why we say that those who died in the flood perish and will not have a resurrection. Because these people were so corrupt, they were so willful in their action, their minds could not be reversed. And so they perish in their own corruption, as the Apostle Peter says. Now let us go back to the home. The Bible does say at Amos 8.11 that there's going to be a famine in the land, a famine not for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of Jehovah. We may not be so concerned over physical malnutrition, yet it does play a serious part in the lives of the people. But spiritual malnutrition or spiritual nutrition is what proves to be a protection to the mind and the heart. When we take spiritual instruction, we prevent corruption to have its heyday in us. And that is why the world is deteriorating head over heels now, because they're abandoned in their wickedness. They're totally corrupt and rotten now, and there's no turning back from their course. And God has given us his principles, his word, his Christianity to stop us in this downward plunge of corruption. And oh, how grateful we should be to Jehovah for this. When things go wrong and children are asked, where did it all happen? They invariably point to the home. It was in the home where the damage was done to their thinking patterns. Only too often we find a way of farming our children out for spiritual training. Sometimes we don't feel like going to the kingdom hall, so we send our children. We think there's where they're going to learn about God. But God is to be learned at home. If you stay home, you send your child out, you don't have good enough reason, the child knows it. And you're destroying the very thing you want to build in that child. Genuineness, honesty, integrity to principle. We think because they can learn to dance at a dancing school that they should be able to learn the Bible truths by sending them out to someone else, farming them out to others to teach them God's word. But the best place to teach the children the truth is in the home. Now, we must remember that the home has a lifestyle all of its own. The whole character of the home is decisive in the growth of the child. Your house is unique above all the homes in the earth. It is what happens at home that influences the child. I remember a Gilead student was asked, what influenced you to, be, to go to Gilead and to become a missionary? And the little girl said, when I was five years old, my grandmama, used to take me on her knee and she used to talk to me about the missionary life and the full-time work and the girl says the rest was natural I knew what I wanted to be as soon as I graduated from high school and she did go to Gilead and she went to Venezuela on an assignment so where did it all begin it began in a home it began from grandma talking to the child or mama talking to the child or dad pumping it into the sun one thing I can say to you is, don't be afraid to talk the truth to your children, whether they want to hear it or not. Children, don't, some of them don't like to eat fish, but you put fish before them and you say, eat. They don't like to eat cabbage, but you stuff it down them because you know you want them to become strong. Truth they need to hear, and those little minds may resist it, but one of these days 
is going to pay dividends because this is what they're going to remember. Your genuineness, your conscientiousness in training and teaching of your children in the home. Some of us have not taken the truth so seriously. We adults, we play at it. We study the Bible now and then. We might even go out and service now and then. We attend meetings now and then. We make professions of our faith now and then. We may even seek to understand the truths and get to understand little things here and there. But Eve, every now and then, we make excursions. We come up missing at the Kingdom Hall. Maybe we will show up at Memorial Nights, that's for sure. We can't miss it. As if that's going to make a big difference in our lives. Some of us never seem to come to a dedication of our lives where we make a commitment to serve whole soul to Jehovah and put this old world behind us. Some of us grown-ups are scared of baptism as if God is not there to help us in our weaknesses. Some of our brothers are afraid of responsibility. I don't want to be an elder. You think I want to sit in all those meetings? Sit in the back row. This is what we communicate in the home to our children. And how do we expect our children to be strong if by our actions we are teaching them weakness? We want to free will it through life and into the new system of things. In that frame of mind, we find no particular joy being in the truth or being one of Jehovah's Witnesses. We feel no urgency, no commitment, no drive to be active and energized with the spirit of Jehovah. Believe me, our children will not become Christians automatically. They must be told, they must be taught, they must be nurtured, they must be fed and led if we want them to be genuine Christians. The political state is not going to teach your children. Those teachers in the schools today, God forbid, they're not going to teach your children the truth. They might teach them everything else. Sorry to say. But truth is not one thing. From God, they're not going to tell them. So that is rest upon you. And if you don't do it, who is? Passing the truth of God on down to our children, even after they grow up, deserves the highest possible priority. Firstly, that responsibility rests upon the parents at home, and only secondly to the congregation. Whether we have children or not, we owe something to those who in the past years transmitted to us the joy and the challenge of the Christian faith. Every parent should have the spirit of teaching others the good news of the kingdom. We are nurtured by the truth of the good news. Truth of the good news feeds us, brothers. It gives us the strength that we need. We enjoy the fellowship of the home and the Christian congregation. We must inculcate by words and examples truth these into our children. The inherent commandment to go and to make disciples of peoples of all nations and to preach and to teach. Our children, when they're growing up, must know that this is their goal in life. This is what God wants them to do. It's in the Bible, and that is what I'm to be, a servant of the living God here on earth. We must inculcate that into their mind and into their heart. Children must be taught to feed on truth that come forth from the mouth of God. They must feast on experiences that are in the field and rejoice in service meetings and in the watchtower studies. Be these studies what they are. Try to learn from them. Try to experience from them. What happens at the watchtower and service meetings and at conventions constitutes the things that should be told to the children at the home because this is spiritual food for them. Now, it is not enough just to appreciate the truth, to have the faith. We must concern ourselves with transmitting faith to others. 
and especially so to our children, because that is our God-given responsibility. So one thing is to have the truth, another thing is we must have the potential to transmit it to others. In the big cities of the world, there is not much in them that would inspire faith in Jehovah, to put it mildly. But did you know that in that little town of Lystra, where Timothy came from, there was not even a Jewish synagogue? On the other hand, there was a monstrous pagan temple. So you ask yourself, what chance did the mother have to bring up her child in the truth, to worship Jehovah in that little town of Lystra, where the odds were against them. But the Apostle Paul said that a mother told her daughter, or grandmother told her daughter, and the daughter told her son, and the son came to have genuine faith in the living God. Brothers, believe what you want. Say what you will. The home is where our preferences our priorities are established and demonstrated. What goes on in the home, especially behind closed doors, is what indelibly labels the child for life. You can pray all you want, you can preach all you want, but if the home is not right, every child will know, it'll know it, and will be affected by it. My job at Bethel is working with personnel, and I deal with the young people that come there. And invariably, I'll tell you this, these young men here, they're not so young. Some of their age were kings. These might be men 19, 20, 21, 22, 3, 24, 25 years old. They come and they sit there, and so often they tell me that Coming to Bethel was the first time in their life they realized that what their folks were telling them was the truth of God. They came into the truth when they came into Bethel. And when they have trouble, a lot of the brothers have trouble embracing the truth. They want to know, how can I prove it now? And when you find a brother like that, invariably he comes from a broken home where a father may not be in the truth or a mother may not be in the truth, you do not realize how this affects a child. And so in those circumstances, a mother and a father must work doubly to try to change, train and influence their child of the genuineness of God's Word that the child may understand and appreciate Jehovah's Word. Think of a home where there is a loud, coarse language no prayers, no talking about God. What propelling force for Christianity is there in such an environment? What happens in the home counts. So don't let anyone tell you differently. What goes on in the home has power, it has dignity, all of its own. Your home is unique. The home is a part of you. It's a part of your memory. Little wonder, Paul says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure it dwells in you. Why do we want to tell our children these things? We tell them because we love them, we wish them well, we want them the very best there is in life, we want them to speak of God. We want them to praise Jehovah, to enjoy life to the full and have the hope of everlasting life. We want our children to live eternally, brothers. And if you parents want your children to live forever, this is the time to begin. It's in fact late. You should have begun when it was in the womb. Because that's where you learn and begin to train the children in the way they should go. We want them to have the intelligent minds, rich and meaningful lives, filled with experiences which will nurture them along the way throughout life for all eternity. We want them to have the pleasant memories, the hopes, the very thoughts that belong 
to Christian witnesses of Jehovah. We want them, when they talk of Eden, when your son comes to you and begins to talk about Adam and Eve, you want to look at him in amazement as if, Son, were you there? Because the way you talk is that is as if you lived in Eden. Yes, that's the way we should teach. Teach as if you were there because Eden existed. It's a part of our faith. Talk of a flood, the flood of Noah's day, as if you were in that ark with Noah and the animals. Speak of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as if these were your very brothers, your relatives. You knew them personally from face to face. That is how you transmit faith. Talk of the Red Sea as if you were walking with Moses and you saw that wall of water to the left and to the right of you. And when you got on the other side, the way you sang Jehovah's praises for the victory that he's given you. Wouldn't it be nice to hear your children talk of Pastor Russell? Pastor Russell was rather a remarkable man from the early youth on up. Or even Judge Rutherford. Judge Rutherford was a sort of a a Goliath in a Christian body, great big sort of fellow. But he took on Christendom, challenged Christendom, and to stand by him you felt like a midget because not only was his voice strong, but here was a man of faith. He says, let me at her, I'll tear her apart, he says, because of her wickedness. And believe me, the Catholic Church trembled when that man went on the air. Let your children know this. Jehovah raised up champions in this day and age. Let them know about Brother Nor, who thought about spreading the good news to every corner of the earth, teaching them in ways when we didn't even have a, a driblet of publishers. Yet this man's vision said, let the gospel go to the ends of the earth and we're going to have missionaries and we're going to send them in there. He was a real general in the Christian army, truly sending out people in, in lands no one has ever gone before as far as the truth was concerned. Now the home again. Most of us, if not all of us, have had some family experience. You know how it is. Someone in the family will say, remember the other night when I drove the car in and it was wrecked? And Ma said, where's the car? And all of this. And so suddenly everybody joins in on the experience. And when you get something going that happens in the home, nobody shuts up. Everybody joins in. So when you get a good Bible discussion going, let everybody join in because that is how faith is born. It's a living experience. It's the way Jehovah wishes us to learn the truth. The Bible is a beautiful story of life, of families, of homes. In fact, Jesus, one of the most powerful illustrations that he gave was the prodigal son, where a father had two sons, the older son and the younger one. And the younger one wanted his money to go out into the world and to blow it out there. He wanted to travel and he squandered his finances. And what did the son think about when he was out there feeding the pigs? He says, you know, these pigs live better than I do, he says. And lo and behold, he says, in my father's house, and he began to think of home. Why did he think of home? Because he lived there, he experienced life there, and his father he understood and appreciated very well. Our sh children should know the history of faith. They should see people in paradise. They should feel the need for surviving chaos. They should know about marrying and having children. They should know about the priests of Israel and about praying and laughing, about dancing. We should teach our children courage, strength, because the truth gives us boldness. We should teach our children we're living at a time that Jesus' words are true, that we should lift up our heads and rejoice.
for our redemption is nigh. We have a thing to be proud of to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses because Jehovah has chosen the cream to survive this system into the one to come wherein dwells righteousness. What we talk about is not a wish. What we talk about is a God-given reality because the very words of God are inspired of him. Before writing was invented, stories of faith were transmitted by word of mouth. Fathers walked with their sons, daughters walked with their mothers and, and grandmothers, and they talked themselves to sleep. Today there's not enough of this communication between father and son, mother and daughter, the hand-in-hand -hand conversation. We're living in critical times, hard to deal with today. And we have to give attention to the training of our children for everlasting life, because if we don't, no one else is going to do it. Spend some time each day with each one of your children. At least five to ten minutes every day. Take your child aside and individually, nobody around, and just spend five wholesome minutes with your child. They'll never forget it. And you fathers out there, just take a little bit of time and take your son and say, Son, I want you to know what happened to me today. And just make a sort of a confession, father to son confession, and tell them about how hard and how I pray to Jehovah. And that job of mine is so difficult, you know, and how I pray for the kingdom when all of this will be done away. Those few minutes in life add strength to the child. And when that child will grow up, he will cherish it. It will be strength to his bones to move on. To be able to be faithful in life, he will remember how his dad talked to him. Don't be afraid to pray with your children, too, and to pray for them. Talk about Jehovah. Read the Bible with them. Physically is something in, in the States we don't do so much, but the language of touch is very important to children. Don't be afraid to put your arm and squeeze your child a little bit because of the affection that comes from you moves into them. They feel you're warm. They feel your concern. They feel that you love them. So every day, you fathers out there and you mothers, do this for your children. You owe it to them. They have it coming from you. You brought them into life. Teach them now how to live forever. If you can at all, play with them. I know we're busy. Maybe you can set aside a little time for that too. But there's the need for strong counseling, disciplining and righteousness. Always explain the reason why you do it. But don't neglect discipline because as Sacrifice equals love. There's no love without self-sacrifice and there is no righteousness without discipline. We learn righteousness by discipline. So don't hesitate to discipline your child. A young girl said to her daddy, Why didn't you spank me when I didn't do it? She says, I wanted you to. I wanted you to, and you didn't do it. And so the girl went out into the world, into loose living, and she's blaming her father now for not disciplining her in the ways of righteousness. So don't let your child point the finger of you for neglect. Teach your children to think, brothers, to make decisions, don't do all the thinking for them. Make them reason. And this will help them in life. And don't be afraid to see them stumble over now and then. They're going to get up. They're pliable enough. They'll get up and move on in life. Cheer them on. And then if they're in a ministry school and they have a reading, put your arm around them and say, Son, you read beautifully. 
I wished I read like you did when I was your age. And if he dresses well, find something good to say to your children every day. Because by saying good, you build them up and you give them a reason for loving you, for going to you, for confiding in you. Tell them I felt proud the way you were dressed tonight. Your tie, your suit, everything matched perfectly. It was good to see this. Cause your children to soar and to delight in life. Show them which way to go. Give them goals, goals in life for which to strive. You might tell them you may want to become a pioneer or a missionary or build your life around Jehovah's organization. This you want to do. But perhaps you may need a part-time job and therefore you ought to do or take this sort of training so this will help you in life because you not only have to live it for the new system but you have to survive this old system and then move on into the new one so help your child do that learn the art of caring and teach them this subject is so big that uh, it's hard to cover but its rewards are many too but it does teach us that lessons, the lesson of importance of the home in the rearing of children. There is where it all begins. Please never underestimate what you do at home and its effect on you and your child. Make your home life one that the children, like the prodigal son who left his home for a better life, found how wrong he was. He learned that the pigs at home had a better life than he did. The father ran out to meet him. Let that be our relationship with our children. And we pray upon you, parents. We pray upon you, God's blessing, as you set out on this greatest of all challenges, the training of your children in the nurture and the admonition of Jehovah. Work at it, brothers, diligently. Pour your heart into it, because Jehovah will bless you for it. And to the extent that you devote your energy, you children out there, be obedient to your parents, listen to them. Together, work with your parents, and your parents work with your children. To the extent that you work together, to the glory of God, May this great God of ours, our Father Jehovah, bless each and every one of you richly. I thank you. Well, Brother Sidlick, all 4,736 of us certainly want to thank you for helping us to appreciate more critically that faith building certainly does begin at home.